if you have an editor in a media company that would like to select teaser images the editor can say I want this with that with that and then we bring uh, like this tool to facilitate the selection of these images <laughs> We've all heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. And while that may be true, for data scientist Shad Safarani, it's also worth a thousand data points. Shad is one of the bright minds behind SmartArt, a powerful tool able to select the most aesthetically pleasing images from video material. How that works? This is what we'll find out in this episode of We Talk Data. I'm Christian Marshall, and joining me today is data scientist Shad Safarani. Shad, it's great to have you here. Thank you, Christian. I'm glad to be here as well. Before we take a look at smart art, which I'm really excited about, I'd love to hear about you as a data scientist. How did you get into data science in the first place? Yeah, so a uh, very good question. Uh, I, I originally come from Syria, where mm -hmm. I actually started uh, my studies in informatics um, in 2013, as I remember. And in 2015, uh, I got a full scholarship to come to Germany. And there I ch changed my major slightly to cognitive science, where I did my bachelor at the University of Osnabrück. Um, and cognitive science is about, is not just technical uh, study domain, but rather uh, it's uh, interdisciplinary, basically, where you study psychology, linguistics, uh, philosophy of mind, besides informatics and uh, AI to understand the brain. So after my uh, doing my bachelor's, uh, I, I was very interested in the technical side of understanding the brain and kind of uh, implementing uh, bio biology inspired, let's say, AI kind of. Um, and that's where I specialized further uh, during my master's studies in AI and uh, got like some experience um, and some hands on experience with uh, uh, state of the art technologies that have been developed in the last few years. Um, and you know, like uh, it includes machine learning in the first place because it has witnessed like some very uh, huge advancements, mm -hmm. uh, all, but also the other, uh, like, uh, let's say, application areas of AI, computer vision specifics, or uh, natural language processing, uh, when it comes also to some uh, simulations of uh, self-driving uh, environments and so on. Um, now, data science is uh, overlaps uh, to a large extent with machine learning, mm -hmm. uh, b based on uh, the algorithms you use and the problems you solve. Um, and this is like the most known term that people use for like in industry um, to solve, uh, let's say, automation related problems. Um, so during my master's, I had some experience in a media company uh, called Iconex, uh, uh, yeah, where I worked on computer vision, machine learning related topics. Uh, and after finishing my master's, uh, I wanted to uh, do full-time job and like uh, advance my experience further uh, in this field uh, where I can also like solve challenging problems and that's the reason why I ended up like in RTL um, mm -hmm. where I basically use my uh, let's say previous experience and knowledge that I collected from all these years and also develop further. Yeah, and you've been here at RTL since April of this year, 2021. Yes. And your current project is Smart Art. That sounds like a real curious mix of cognitive science and art. So what does this project entail? Yeah, I really like uh, the association mm -hmm. uh, you, um, you have the impression of. Uh, uh, so basically, um, smart art is about, um, in, in simple words, let's define mm -hmm. it. Uh, it's a tool that could help uh, uh, facilitate the facilitation of editorial processes. In other words, like if you have an editor in a media company that would like to select teaser images um, for advertising a movie, for example, super simple use case, then uh, you would have usually a lot of, le not a lot, several, let's say several people uh, uh, kind of uh, selecting images with certain criteria. Mm -hmm. And based on that, the editor can say, okay, I pick that one for this advertisement or that one for, the, for this movie and so on. And uh, in our, um, in, in, in this software, we try to automate this process to a large extent while still keeping the, the human in the loop, so to speak, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, such that we can automate this filtering process of selecting these images uh, given a video or a movie 
of two hours long rather than humans sitting and trying to select images for hours long kind of to find the right one. So it still technically sounds like something a human can do, but you've trained a machine to do it. So what sort of artificial intelligence are you implementing here in the process? Simply, we've been using uh, plenty of um, uh, models that we train ourselves or that are already pre-trained uh, to um, uh, that could help us understand the uh, visual content uh, in images and videos and based on that select candidate images that editors could be interested in. This is including, uh, for example, object detection, so where you detect different kinds of objects like tables, cars, trucks, buildings in an image or in a sequence of images. Also, we have like face-related uh, feature extraction, like uh, you want to detect where the face appears in an image or uh, to which celebrity this face belongs, kind of, so just to know which kind of heroes are there in the image or in a scene in a video. But also we can detect their emotional expressions in, th in the faces, so like whether uh, there is a happy person in that scene or there is um, um, an angry face in that scene and so on and that also can be associated with the let's say the gener generic uh, type of the movie so if, if they say like I want uh, this is a horror movie I want like uh, a dark um, uh, image where a person is uh, scared or like terrified or something then we can detect that emotion with that face of that celebrity um, in that building or in that dark kitchen, let's say. Now, are you implementing filters here or what are you doing to facilitate the process for the editor? How specific can he or she be? Yeah, so, so basically uh, we try to provide a lot of options for the editor to guide basically this filtering content filtering process. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have like, let's say, separate modularities that could understand different aspects of the content of images and sequence of images, like uh, in a like continuous scene or a shot. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, let's say, render candidate images uh, that have these qualities. So let's say um, you have, again, just a simple example is um, an editor wants an image with uh, 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 basically where there is plenty of people because this could be something like a party or I don't know Christmas event or something but also they want the colors to be very diverse you know mm -hmm. or maybe it should be outdoors so as you can see there are these levels of um, yeah different levels where you can describe content and it become very complex and we kind of modularize the modularize the processing of the content and provide a lot of options where the editor can say, I want this with that, with that. And then we bring uh, like this tool to facilitate the selection of these images. And then he has to choose at the end among these candidates, let's say. Okay, I mean, that sounds like a lot of detail, a lot of information, a lot of data to recognize and classify. And so I, I imagine it being very complex, especially when you mention emotions. So is it more difficult to program an algorithm that recognizes emotions? I imagine it being easier to recognize sports cars than um, sadness or happiness. Yeah, that's uh, rather, let's say, a paradox. Uh, I, I, I like the question. So um, uh, I think you're right. While uh, recognizing like uh, clear ob objects in, in an image uh, sound like very intuitive uh, and it is not, let's put it this way. Okay. Um, uh, it's just what you need is plenty of data to train this machine uh, to solve a task. And if the task is uh, spotting different kinds of objects, then the question is what, o what object it is. Is it only sports car or mm -hmm. is it like, I don't know, nor city car or when it comes to bike, also you have plenty of bike mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. then and then other categories and other subcategories and sub subcategories. So recognizing objects means uh, distinguishing and disambiguating uh, among so many, let's say, e entries to the, to the uh, algorithm, but also um, having enough data to be trained on for each object. So, okay. um, so a if, car if, is just not a car. Exactly. So if that sounds to you, 
uh, like let's say very challenging, I can say it's not these days mm -hmm. because we have very uh, a lot of data that we can try train these algorithms on regarding object recognition. Mm -hmm. So much data uh, and so much like and, and those algorithms prove to be also good at these tasks. But when it comes to emotions, you'd rather have much uh, um, much smaller number of categories. So like, okay. w for example, in like uh, in the research open source, let's say models, mm -hmm. they would uh, like the norm is to uh, detect among seven emotions, basically. So anger, uh, surprise, uh, fear, happiness, mm -hmm. neutral, sadness, and then another one. I forgot, uh, I think it, it was discussed. Mm -hmm. And basically, as you can see, the number of categories is very it's much smaller. Much smaller. Yeah. But providing the data for that is much harder. Okay. And if you actually do some research, like to find appropriate data set, I'm talking about open source data sets, mm -hmm. like in industry, companies might use their own data and so on, um, then it becomes much harder. So it's a paradox. Do you have the data? And how challenging the task is, regardless whether you have the data, the data or, not. or not. Okay, I see. So we've talked a little bit about recognizing objects, recognizing emotions. What about recognizing things that aren't static? What about uh, a fight scene, uh, punching, kicking, or a love scene, kissing, hugging? Uh, can you use smart art to recognize that sort of thing? Yeah, for, so for, for that we have also in, in the recent, let's say, machine learning literature, mm -hmm. I, I, I like to talk from um, research point of view because also it is very known to the audience, let's say, especially data science audience. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, um, the, there is this norm, action recognition. So you can give the algorithm sequence of consecutive images where it, re it represents, let's say, a shot of a movie or a sub-scene in the movie, um, and then the machine can recognize which action there is. And most of the time you need humans to perform that action, whether it's punching or kissing or ch car chasing or mm -hmm. uh, playing or eating or drinking or sleeping. All these kind of things uh, can be actually detected and, and it's proved basically um, to, to be like, like this algorithm to be very effective at this. So this is also w one thing we work on so that the editor can um, also be, m like have more flexibility to choose the meaning of the image, you know, that the image can convey. And sometimes just wanted to mention uh, a part of the smart art, just if we roll back a little bit, is not just about these teaser images, but also if the editor wants to say, um, wants to choose like the, let's say the scene or the sub scene that wraps that image, mm -hmm. he could retrieve that as well, okay. based on the action that this image uh, is associated with, let's say. So, mm -hmm. Is there anyone else that gets to use smart art? Or would you say it's limited to editors who are looking to create teasers? Or what sort of other problems could smart art solve? Yeah, so basically, uh, one thing that uh, we internally can benefit from uh, uh, via smart art is also uh, debugging, like using it as a debugging tool. So mm -hmm. it could help us validate the, eff the effectivity, let's say, of our models and the usability of our models. Like, let's say we want to add a new feature mm -hmm. to extract or to filter out. Maybe smart art is a very nice, just uh, on the fly tool to visualize qualitatively whether that new feature works also in a combination with other features. Uh, I'm talking about internal usage mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. uh, but also uh, I think um, it has more potential in my opinion that in the company also we consider like, I think the discussion about this is open uh, regarding, um, let's say using smart art as a part of a bigger uh, let's say software or a broader software that uh, could analyze visual content and provide like a comprehensive analysis about uh, a video or a scene or an image um, regarding its content. Like you can, like one, one simple example can be um, how, how many times Tom Cruise appears in a scene in Mission Impossible 1 and 2 and 3, mm -hmm. and what does he do there, and what are the statistics of these actions, and so on. And you know, if you really deep dive into the content and compare different movies and so on, then it could interest a lot of, let's say, customers, and uh, yeah, there is potential for much more use cases than you would think. 
let's say. Okay, and so out of these open discussions regarding this, do you have any concrete plans for further development? Do you, can you say where smart art is now and where you think it'll be maybe in one to two years? Uh, so let's put it this way. It's uh, from what I've uh, been working on regarding smart art and what I heard also about its current status, um, it's uh, very far in progress regarding mm -hmm. data science part. So regarding the models and the filters and the content related analysis that smart art can provide. Um, now regarding the deployment and optimizing the um, uh, the processing of these modularities, as I mentioned, and, and how they can be merged with our database and the and external databases and so on. This is uh, currently in a progress um, and progressing very fast. Um, but regarding the data science, as I said, it's already in a very ready to use fashion, let's say. Okay. I'd be curious to know, has working on object recognition and emotion recognition, facial recognition, changed the way you watch trailers, changed the way you watch TV. You know, if you log into Netflix and see a teaser and you think, oh, this has been selected, you know, they know what I want to see. Um, yeah, what is what has it done to you personally, the way you then experience media? So, okay, um, honestly speaking, I, I think this is not very new to me. So mm -hmm. even before uh, I was in RTL, I was exposed to these kind of technologies, whether in research or whether in industry, in media companies. And and uh, in RTL, it just like gave me better and deeper, let's say, picture about how this is produced and how powerful these tools are, let's say. Um, yeah, so coming back to your question, uh, it did not change, right? But because it's like a gradual process. Mm -hmm. But the person who who I am now uh, is very different from three, four years ago. Okay. Um, regarding how powerful these technologies are and how, like, um, how much potential they have for causing harm, also. So, in other words, they are they are. I I see them as a double. Uh, edged sword kind mm -hmm. of and I like let's say the idea that I have the privilege from my knowledge and experience to um, uh, to be like uh, among these like few people that know about these technologies really can decipher them know their limitations how to advance them in the very soon future how fast the technology develops and how they can be used for good and for bad so this can be um let's say, uh, exciting always, you know, as a scientist and as a um, data scientist in a company and so mm -hmm. on, uh, because also it pays you well and so on. But in, on the other hand, I am very uh, reflective about it. I think I have a huge responsibility on my shoulder regarding these technologies because like, as you can see, in my opinion, what I see from big giants, tech giants, especially from the US, like Facebook or mm -hmm. YouTube, uh, their recommendation systems and so on, a lot of studies show actually that like, um, I mean, not a lot of studies, but like clear studies show that um, they they can uh, be very uh, harmful for teenagers and so on if these companies don't make sure uh, they don't focus on the, like on this um, profit part, but rather focus on serving the people and optimizing also their time for productivity, but not just mm -hmm. like to keep them on screen. So for me, um, it's not about me watching them and just like being careful not to use technology, but because I, I, I'm not affected by it when I know that it tries to manipulate my brain and so on. Yeah. It's more about how can I actually have a better impact and how can I, um, let's say, yeah, contribute even with small steps towards better and healthier so social condition, let's say. And uh, Honestly speaking, like in RTL so far, although it was has been like just a few months, not like mm -hmm. two or three years, let's say, I feel very free to talk out loud my opinion, uh, even like in contact with uh, my data science heads and managers. And, mm -hmm. and, and also I'm encouraged always to bring up any opinion or idea that I find um, interesting or even when it relates to ethics and, and when mm -hmm. it relates to... Um, how useful and how healthy these technologies are and how can we make them better and so on. So 
um, yeah, this is who I am so far. And, you know, as I said, double edged sword. Yeah, but I thing. find who you are very inspiring. <laughs> Thank I think you. you're, yeah, Thank I think your conviction and your approach to using data science for the good, very inspiring. Thank you. I'd love to know what do you want to work on in the future? Do you already have an idea what's beyond smart art for you? Yeah, so uh, basically uh, there are two parts of this question on uh, data scientist, RTL data scientist level, let's say, and mm -hmm. on personal level in long term, very long term, let's say life plans. Okay. So on, on data scientist in RTL level uh, for the like, let's say next few years, um, I, I think my, my focus can be uh, diverse, not just on computer vision, but also all the other fields like in audio, text, and so on. Um, currently, I can answer this question like about what I currently uh, work on, uh, um, regardless of smart art. Uh, I try to, uh, let's say, do some research, which actually I think a lot of data scientists wish to do in industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so what a cool thing, you get paid very well and you do research <laughs> and you bring up your own ideas. Can't um, beat that. Ex exactly, so, so I, I, I like do some research on how to uh, describe movies numerically mm -hmm. uh, based on all these modularities that we, we uh, extract from visual content. So let's say if you have a movie, I don't know, Fast and Furious or whatever movie and you collect all the statistics that relates to the content you know how many objects and cars and and uh, what happens in that scene and mm -hmm. which celebrity what he does in that shot and so on so for example all of the data that you could also pull out of smart how art do you make sense out of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to to describe that movie and you say oh the movie of tom cruise uh, of Mission Impossible 1 is different from Mission Impossible 2. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? As a human, you can al already do that, right? You right, just watch right. the intro and you're done. Yeah, but I, yeah. the algorithm doesn't know how to do that just by understanding what objects appear in images or something. So okay. this is what I'm currently, let's say, researching and I'm interested in. And this, is, this has the potential always to improve our recommendation systems, uh, make it more diverse for the mm -hmm. user, uh, also improve personalization and so forth. Coming back to the second part of the question on personal level, um, in general, since I started, and I think this is like an endless journey, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, I have two goals in life regarding my career. One is um, how to advance these technologies, especially that I'm very interested in biology-inspired AI. Um, so something I started from my master thesis, and I think it has to continue. Um, because it has a lot of potential. Um, and second is uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the usability of AI and how we want to use it for the good, not for the bad. This is something, you know, you have to be a little bit smart, not about, uh, how to say, calculating numbers, you know, and doing mm -hmm. statistics, but also about ethics and business values that bring better products to the society better in the sense better for them not for mm -hmm. me just to mm -hmm. have profit so this is something i'm very excited about and i always try to yeah let's say um develop my knowledge of like through my work in rtl and from previous companies and also in the future so yeah yeah it's very inspiring to hear about your work and your dedication to making the world a better place through data science. I'm very excited to Thank see you. where it takes you. I hope I yeah, hear about it, hear about your next project super, soon, super soon in the future. Yeah, thank you for being here today and sharing with us a little bit about your work and your insights. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to meet you. If you enjoyed our conversation today and are interested in other exciting projects here in development at RTL, then be sure to check out our other podcast episodes of We Talk Data, where we take a behind the scenes look at other powerful tools here in development. Thanks for listening. Until next time.